In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. But I would like to speak uh, primarily today about uh, Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, also known, known as um, Edith Stein. She was a Jewish convert uh, born in the um, 19th century, 1891, and uh, became a Carmelite nun. Uh, she eventually ended up in, um, because of her Jewish descent, being a target of the Nazis. But she had an extraordinary life, uh, which we will hear a little bit about today. I, I mention her because her feast day in, in the Novus Ordo calendar is August 9th. So that was his past Sunday. And uh, that's the feast of the uh, vigil of St. Lawrence. It's quite, quite appropriate. Uh, so St. Teresa Benedicta, Edith Stein, was born, as I mentioned, in the year 1891 to Jewish parents in Germany, and she was the youngest of 11 children. Uh, she was brought up by her parents, a religious Jew, but by the time she was 14, she had lost her belief in God entirely. Why? Because she decided, of her own volition, to give up praying. Right, so we see that prayer, talking to God, even in false religions, uh, that relationship with God can, can keep one um, at least in some contact. But she gave that up and lost her belief in God entirely. Well, she was a brilliant young woman and uh, after high school went to a university uh, pursuing further studies. And she says she became what would be considered today a radical feminist. At that time, they were called uh, suffragettes. They were arguing for the rights of women to vote. And now that, that is an issue, women's, women voting. Um, it's not really what it seems. You would think that it's, it's obvious. But at that time, women didn't live outside of the household of either their husband or their father. Uh, women living on their own was, was a, a strange or rare thing. It just wasn't common. And so giving women the right to vote was essentially, it was an attack on the unity of the family. That a woman living with her father would be completely at odds in regards to, I would say, politics, which is very much about uh, social life, family life, um, or, or that a wife would be divided from her husband. Uh, so it was at, at, at under the practical aspect, you're like, why are we doubling the number of votes? Why are we requiring both people to come out of their house and vote when just one could do the same thing? So that is, that is what, um, uh, that, that women's votes, there was, there was a lot more to it than that. Um, but anyways, so she was, she was arguing for this, she was a feminist, and, uh, but she lost interest in that rather quickly, actually, and instead turned her efforts to philosophy. Uh, she became a student of the philosopher Edmund Husserl, who was also a Jew, and he's the founder of uh, phenomenology. That's a philosophy that actually is kind of like the, um, the in vogue philosophy of the Catholic Church today, which is a kind of rather problematic. Uh, the philosophy of the church uh, should be Thomistic, um, uh, Thomistic theology and um, Aristotelian um, logic. Uh, but phenomenology is kind of a compromise between skepticism and enlightenment and all this kind of thing. Uh, she became a, a student of this, this philosopher in phenomenology. Um, and by the age of 26 in 1917, she received a doctoral degree with the highest distinctions. Um, furthering, you know, in investigating philosophy and really thinking. She was still atheistic, uh, but an event happened which really uh, caught her by surprise. We call this a moment of grace. So she doesn't believe in God. She's, she's given up her belief in God entirely. But she, she sees an old woman with a shopping cart uh, going from downtown in, in Frankfurt, Germany. And this old woman goes, stops by a cathedral and goes inside. And um, you would think, okay, what, what's, what's striking about that? But here was the grace. This is what Edith Stein writes about. She says, this was something totally new to me. In the synagogues and Protestant churches I had visited, people simply went to the services. Here, however, I saw someone coming straight from the busy marketplace into this empty church as if she was going to have an intimate conversation. It was something I never forgot. Something as simple as a pious old lady on her way back from shopping, stopping by a cathedral, stopping in to say hello to our Lord. We wouldn't think anything of it. Okay, yeah, we're all supposed to do that. Look at what happened. That was a moment of grace for somebody who didn't believe. Just the fact that we say we have a relationship with God, we want to talk to God throughout the day, we treat God as if a real person because he is the real person, that's, that's astounding to the world. They don't believe it. 
to find people that actually believe it, that is something. And you, you wouldn't think of it. Some old lady with a shopping cart going into the church to pray started the conversion of, of a great philosopher. We never know what we can do, what our good example, what God might do with our good example. So this was the beginning of her conversion, and it continued later that same year with the example of one of her Jewish friends who had converted to Protestantism. Right? I guess halfway is better than nothing. But this friend of hers, she converted, and her friend's husband had just died, and she was visiting her friend, uh, now a widow, and she saw that how her belief in Christianity helped her to bear the suffering well. And so, so there, there's Edith Stein, she doesn't believe in God. Better than that is at least a Jew who does believe in God. Better than that is a Protestant who believes in Jesus Christ, right? There's kind of degrees of, of truth. And so something's better than nothing. But we see here how her friend's belief in the, it was specifically the cross of Jesus Christ that made the difference, uh, another difference, First Teresa Benedicta. And she says of, of this, her friend, this was my first encounter with the cross and the divine power it imparts to those who bear it. This was the moment when my unbelief collapsed and Christ began to shine his light on me. This is, again, this would be something else that we take for granted. When sufferings come to us, which we call crosses, we bear them well. We say, okay, Christ bore his cross, I'm going to bear mine. There's an idea of redemptive suffering. It was Christ's sufferings, specifically on the cross, which redeemed us. Therefore, our suffering can redeem others th through that example. Christ suffered for others, I can suffer for others. That is a monumental um, a change or, or idea to non-believers, to non-Christians. Suffering has value. There, you, there's a positive side to suffering. This is unbelievable to them. So we, don't, we don't realize this. We, we grew up with this stuff. We, we live it. We breathe it, right? I mean, even those who maybe convert. I mean, most, of, you know, most people are Protestant, or at least they were Protestant. Uh, so these are foundational ideas, which is news to a faithless world. So now Edith Stein, she's keenly aware of God and religion, and though she hadn't converted yet, she was, she's well on the road. She starts to read the New Testament, which, by the way, Jews don't read. The New Testament is condemned literature for Jews. Uh, she was reading the New Testament, contemporary authors, and she read the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, whose recommendations she put into practice, which means she started praying again. And so finally one evening, Edith Stein picked up the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila, and she read it all night long. And when she finished the book, she said to herself, this is the truth. And later on, looking back at her life, she would write, my longing for truth was a single prayer. And so uh, that was it. She was baptized six months later on January 1st, 1922. If we remember January 1st, it's the Feast of the Circumcision and that's quite appropriate for a converting Jew. Uh, so she wanted to enter a Discalced Carmelite convent right away, but she was advised otherwise on account of two reasons. One, wait a little bit after your conversion. I mean, it's, we find this it's very common for con uh, converts. They, they enter the church and they're so full of zeal, they just they want to join a monastery, a, a convent, uh, become the priesthood. Hold on, yeah, wait, wait, wait a little bit. And um, that's very prudent. Um, but secondly, so that was the first reason. Secondly, she was an absolutely brilliant philosopher. Uh, and they, wanted, they recognized her talents and wanted her to use them in, in the world. And so she did. She went to, she was given a teaching position in a Dominican school in Germany for the next nine years. And she wrote extensively, uh, and especially she wrote about, uh, she was, started reconciling phenomenology with Thomas Aquinas. She recognized oh, this is, this is the, the philosophy that needs to be used, right? So she's reconciling those. Um, and the, interestingly, the abbot of her local monastery encouraged her to speak extensively on women's issues at the time to give them the proper Catholic perspective. Uh, now here's what St. Teresa, uh, or um, Edith Stein still at this point, she writes, um, during the time immediately before and quite some time after my conversion, I thought that leading a religious life meant giving up all earthly things and having one's mind fixed on divine things only. Gradually, however, I learned that other things are expected of us in this world. I even believe that the deeper someone is drawn to God, the more he has to get beyond himself in this sense to go into the world and carry divine life into it. And this would be, I'm certain she got that from Teresa of Avila. 
because Teresa of Avila says the same thing about those who advance in the spiritual life. She says, first of all, uh, when a person first makes progress in the spiritual life, you leave behind things of the world, utterly, and then you, you immerse yourself in the divine life. But once you've advanced far enough in the divine life, you go back to the world and start bringing other people with you. Right? That's, that's the, the, the um, process of, of Teresa of Avila. So Edith Stein continues in this way until um, 1833, when the Nazi party finally took over in Germany and began civil persecution of those of Jewish ethnicity, of which Edith Stein was one. Uh, and so those of Jewish ethnicity were prohibited from teaching anywhere, public or private, among uh, other uh, restrictions. This is always how persecution begins. It's always civil and legal. And so, so Edith Stein, now that she could no longer serve God through scholarship, teaching was no longer possible, uh, she said she felt as if she had become a stranger in this world. And now by this time, she'd already taken private vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So it seemed pretty clear the, the, the course she was going to take. Uh, she joined a Carmelite convent in Cologne uh, that very same year and took the name Teresa Benedicta Acruce, which is Teresa of the Blessed Cross. So she understood the cross very well uh, by now, um, especially because people of, of great intelligence and great intelligence and perception generally are they're able to perceive more of the evil in the world, more suffering in the world, as uh, King Solomon says that uh, wisdom multiplies sorrows. Right, the more you're aware, the more evil you see, and so she's very well about suffering, but she had learned what to do with it though. Uh, she already knew the cross, and she says of it. I understand the cross as the destiny of God's people, which was beginning to be apparent at the time, 1933. I felt that those who understood the cross of Christ should take it upon themselves on behalf of everyone else. And she was speaking actually specifically of her own, uh, the, the Jewish people whom, whom she converted from. And that's what she means. She says she called them God's people. Uh, she had a very great affinity. Her mother was still Jewish, and her mother never converted, actually, uh, but died on her deathbed, a believing Jew, a sincere Jew, praying to God. And Edith Stein offered prayers for her mother her whole life, uh, that, that her mother might be converted. And there's actually another story of that, um, which I've spoken of before. Um, uh, Father Herman and the Curie of Ars is a story about a, his, uh, a Jewish mother who converts um, after death. Well, at the moment of death, we should say. So Teresa Benedict prays for her people, and she says uh, she's going to take the cross upon herself on behalf of everyone else. Uh, and she, of the war, the coming war, she wrote that um, human endeavors cannot help us, but only the suffering of Christ, and it is my desire to share in it. And she would very soon get her chance. Uh, five years after entering the uh, Carmelite convent on uh, 9 November 1938 uh, was an event called Kristallnacht. And that was a night in which the Nazi party members went around all the cities in Germany and, and in other places in Europe, smashing the windows and vandalizing the property of Jews. Does that sound familiar? Man, vandalism, rioting. Right? That's what all fascists always use when they want to uh, cause unrest and disturbance. So this is called Kristallnacht, 9 November. And uh, that was the beginning of open persecution of the Jews. And Edith Stein heard of this, uh, Teresa Benedicta. And uh, so they were persecuted as, as part of that um, Aryan nation supremacy. And um, she wrote uh, of what she saw coming for the Jews. Um, Even now, I accept the death that God has prepared for me in complete submission and with joy as being his most holy will for me. I ask the Lord to accept my life and my death so that the Lord will be accepted by his people, the Jews, and that his kingdom may come in glory for the salvation of Germany and the peace of the world. At this time, uh, it may seem strange to us, but many Catholic bishops in Europe were very vocal in their criticism. They opposed political correctness. They were outspoken against it, and they were warned. The bishops were warned, if you don't stop criticizing the Nazi party, we will threaten you with retaliation. Uh, we'll go to all your convents, we'll go to all your monasteries, and we'll take out everyone of Jewish descent to a concentration camp. The church refused to give in to bullying. The church refused to give in to this, these demands. She kept uh, publishing pamphlets and speaking out against the Nazi party. And as a result, the Nazis did as they promised. On the 2nd of August in 1942, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross was arrested by the Gestapo while she was in chapel with the other nuns. She was given five minutes to report outside. Uh, she went out and her, her sister, by that time, her, her Jewish sister had joined her in the convent 
And her last words uh, to her sister were, um, um, essentially, let us go to God for our people. Uh, she was sent to various transit camps and finally taken to Auschwitz. And um, in one of her last writings, she would say, I never knew that people could be like this. Neither did I know that my brothers and sisters would have to suffer like this. I pray for them every hour. Will God hear my prayers? He will certainly hear them in their distress. On 7 August in 1942, just five days after she was arrested, uh, Teresa Benedicta was deported to Auschwitz, and that was the end. She never came out. Uh, it's not known exactly what happened to her, but thought that she was most probably gassed on August 9th, uh, which, as, we, as I mentioned, was the Vigil of St. Lawrence, and hence her feast day. So what do we think? What do we make of this? Was, was this a tragedy? Was she the victim of uh, bishops who were, not, who were imprudent? Should the bishops have not spoken out? Should they have not incited the anger of the Nazis by criticizing their evil ways and methods? By no means. It was precisely the courage of the bishops that enabled Teresa Benedicta to die as a martyr. And in fact, she is considered a martyr. Uh, because it was not on account of her Catholic faith specifically, but her Jewish ethnicity that made her a target, uh, but it was the Catholic faith of the bishops that made her a martyr. We will not be silent. We will preach the truth of Christ in season and out of season. And that is a deep message in that not only are we called to be outspoken for Christ when our life is on the line, we have to be outspoken for Christ when other people's lives are on the line. And this is a grave duty of bishops, is to teach their flock. It is not the body that matters as much as the soul. It is not death in body that is, that is to be feared. It is death of the soul. It's not sickness in body, disease of the body, virus of the body that is to be feared. It is virus of the soul, virus of the, of the uh, sicknesses in the soul. That is the message bishops should be sending to their flock. And I would say that this, this Feast of Teresa Benedicta is also it's, it's a, cre a credit to those bishops at the time. that They were not silent, that they were outspoken against what? Against racism, the proper way. Against fascism in the proper way. It was on account of the faith, and it cost them. That's the thing. You, you, if you see somebody who's outspoken against something, and they're going with the tide of the world, and the world is all about this, this is political correctness, uh, be suspect. Right? It's, when, it's when people have to suffer for their faith. It's when people suffer in standing up for the truth, in standing up. It's when they suffer for it. That's when it's something. Not when everybody else is going along with it and it's the in vogue thing to do and politically correct. Uh, so what did Teresa Benedicta say of this? Well, she would completely have agreed that God uh, heard her prayer. Um, will God hear my prayers? And she died five, five days later. And millions of, of her, her, as she would call them, God's people, the Jews, would die as well. Uh, will God hear my prayers? Certainly he will hear them. Because she writes, she wrote earlier in life, Things were in God's plan which I had not planned at all. I am coming to the living faith and conviction that, from God's point of view, there is no chance. And that the whole of my life, down to every detail, has been mapped out in God's divine providence and makes complete and perfect sense in God's all-seeing eyes. And she was a philosopher. She was a deep philosopher. She thought very, very deeply about uh, things like being and existence and time and chance and providence and predestination. She understood these to a very, very high degree. And that is something that she wrote after deep consideration. God does see all, and we may not understand it, but he understands it, and everything, the smallest detail, not, the, not a hair of our head, falls to the ground without his foreknowledge. Uh, God does not will evil to be done, but he permits evil to be done that he might draw a greater good out of it. And, and that truly is the mystery of the cross, the great mystery of the cross, in that the worst event in human history, the crucifixion of Christ, was also the best, because by it he effected our salvation. St. Teresa Benedicta understood that very well. She gave her life willingly to God uh, on a, on, on, for the love of Christ, for the love of her people, uh, the, the Jews, that they might convert. Uh, so our lesson is to be willing to do that very same thing, is give our life uh, to Christ, whether he wants uh, us to live a long life of suffering and hardship, uh, a long life of relative ease, or a short life where we are martyred, uh, we, we die of sickness, whatever it may be, all things are in God's plan. We unite ourselves 
uh, to him through that suffering. That is our cross. That is how we will convert the world. Uh, Teresa Benedicta understood that. Uh, let us pray to her uh, for, for understanding that as well in our lives, whatever persecution may come. God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.